Hello, everyone. This is Corey. You are listening to the C Squared podcast with Corey and Curtis. We are here today with Ian, who has done a little bit of everything in the music industry. So he's going to be touching on a lot of different topics, a lot of good information. So first, I just want to say thank you for being with us here today. Oh, thanks for having me. (laughs) And so just for the people who don't know, and I know this is probably going to be like a big list, but the nutshell version of Know, who you are, what you do, um, what you've accomplished, because you've done a lot in this industry, but I mean, some people may not be aware of it. <laughs> just right. a little bit. He's done just a tiny little amount. No, it's a lot. Little <laughs> things. Yeah, just a couple. <laughs> One or two. Um, so you just want like a rundown? Yep. Yeah, sure. Just yeah, because we I mean, have a I lot of new playing, people. Started playing in 82, uh, sort of came out of the post-punk uh, hardcore scene in Toronto, even though we were in a hardcore band. Um, and I was in a band called Change of Heart for 15 years up until 97. Um, we won this contest in Toronto where uh, the prize was $100,000, believe it or not. And uh, so we invested in a studio and I started mm-hmm. producing because of that. And uh, I guess I've been making records since about, I don't know, 95 or so. And uh, I'm just passing about 110 records. So, I'm, uh, you know, curse. Oh. I don't know. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> just, just 110 records. Just just 110 records. Well, you know, some people, you know, like some people have done, you know, 30,000 and, you know, some of the, you know, the the 60s, you know, people have done yeah. you know, thousands of records. So <laughs> but you but you are a little bit you, you you are quite prolific. I mean, you know what I mean? So I try to work all the time, yes. Yeah, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, just a Ian's horn just for a second he wasn't change of heart I think you guys had like it wasn't like a top 10 hit in Canada uh it was a top 10 hit in Saskatoon actually oh, was it Saskatoon I it was in Saskatoon there was like a super progressive radio programmer there and he was like I love this song okay and for some reason it went it went top 10 there yeah well, well he was you were on you were on much music quite a bit in the 90s yes. I, I got it that much mm-hmm. you yeah. were in my quite a bit in the 90s and he is quite well known in Toronto if, if you name if you mention Ian's name to anybody in Ontario they light up and they go like he's a rock god so just a mm-hmm. little tiny bit um <laughs> and and on top of that um you also have future now which is an now which is a band that I've helped you with in the past mm-hmm. for PR mm-hmm. um sorry sorry Ian not to embarrass you I just wanted to toot your horn just a teeny little bit there but he does um, that a lot <laughs> yeah, I, I like to toot the horns. Um, but okay, can you kind of go over your your role as like a producer, mixer, etc., engineer? Mm-hmm. What's kind of like the difference between those? Because a lot of bands get these roles conflated. Right. Yeah. Um, go- I think it really. I I think a lot of it had, depends on the project. Um, okay. You know, the, depending on how much of a vision the band has, or whether you know, because I, I mean, I'll work. I'll do anything from you know, just, just engineering, just mixing, just producing, um, or a combination of all those things. So you just have, I think you have to be adaptable to Mm -hmm. what the band wants and kind of be aware of like where your role starts and ends, you know, within each project. I think that's something actually that's really important is defining those roles at the beginning of a project so that you don't run into problems. So, okay. So can you kind of say like, what, what does a producer actually do then? Because I mean, a lot of bands, they don't, understand it like what do right. they do mm-hmm. so if i'm if i'm doing like a full production job um yep. it would be like we would be starting in the rehearsal space with songs um going through songs m- maybe getting rid of parts rewriting parts uh working on tempos you know key whether the key's right that kind of thing mm-hmm. um and I, the reason I do that is just because I like, once we get to the studio, I want it to be a creative process and not be worrying about the little things like that. Mm-hmm. So that if somebody has an idea that's great, we can just go with it, you know? And it's like, we already have this framework to work from. Fair. So it's kind of like the product, the producer, just to put it in a nutshell version, would be kind of like the manager for the creative process, correct? Yeah, like the one, per, like if it's, if I'm doing a full on production thing, I'm starting in the rehearsal space and that job goes all the way to the end of mastering, like uh, approving the master. Okay. Um, so, okay. And then, so for your role as a producer, so now how do you kind of figure out or kind of like, how does a band approach you and you kind of figure out if you're, if you're good to work together? Because I would imagine you don't take everything. 
Um, I actually take a lot of, I take almost everything. The only time I don't take something is generally um, if I have another project in that time period, um, sure. just because I like to work. Um, and also I really enjoy doing like lots of different things. Um, so if I can go from like, uh, you know, the heaviest stoner band to a folk act, that's awesome. Cause it gives my ears a break. What are your favorite types of projects to work on? Like, what is the people one that is just awesome. like- People who are huh? awesome is always just great. It's like, <laughs> um, and that's one thing I like about working with lots of different genres is like you get, mm -hmm. when you find a band that's just really, really fun and creative, that's that's when it's exciting. So it's not all, it's not like genre based. It's just personality based with people For me, who it's are- Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I personally, I like, you know, uh, a little bit on the heavier side of things. So mm -hmm. when I do get to work with a band like that, I really love it. Like the, the low orbit record we tried, we were like, let's just try and make the heaviest record we possibly can. And that was really, really fun. But also it's just, you know, people too. It's like, you know, sometimes it doesn't matter if you love the band, you might not be able to get along with them. You know? Yeah. 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 <clears throat> um, that, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. question, question just on the genre thing. So maybe this is a dumb question, but so how how do you know like how did you kind of know that you could work on those different albums and make them sound good like most people have a specialty but you just said that you're you're happy to give your ears a break and do all these different things like mm -hmm. how does that work sometimes it doesn't work oh. <laughs> <laughs> um uh but you know i i think uh just wanting you know if it, it, talking with the artist about what they want and uh knowing whether i can do it or not you know it's like um I also, you know, just being an engineering, being thrown into things sometimes is really exciting. Like I had to do a, a bluegrass session once with one microphone and it was like, you only get one microphone. And just to be able to try that is like, it's awesome, you know? That's cool. Yeah. Um, so what kind of, so, so I'm, I'm kind of going off, going off a little bit off topic here, but what kind it's of- not unusual for you. Not unusual for me at all. So what kind of what kind of budget should a band expect to have to do like if they wanted to work with you, for example, since you're sitting here in front of me, like what kind of budget would we be talking if you do a full on production job with them? Ooh, it really I really I think it works the it works the other way. Like yeah, oh. having the amount of money first and then deciding what we can get out of that amount of money. Interesting. Um, you know, like, like if you, I mean, if you have 50 grand, then yes, let's go to a, an incredible studio for a couple of days and cut drums. But that doesn't really happen. And sometimes a band is like, we have enough money for three days. And like, you have to make a record work in three days. Well, and okay, well, and I've also made a record work in a day. Like I, you know, this, um, uh, I did a doom band from Toronto and we did the whole record in like 18 hours, I think. Okay, what's what, what's the minimum? Because you said they, they have they got to come to you with the money. Like, I mean, obviously, fifteen hundred bucks isn't gonna fly. Like, what, like what are we talking? I've like, made records for fifteen hundred dollars, though. No, fifty. You know? I said, 50. Oh, fifty. Yeah, fifty. <laughs> but what what would you say would be like the minimum amount? Like, band wants to get a like they want they need your help. What would be like the minimum they would? Need? I mean, literally, I've done a record for five hundred dollars because it's been one oh. day. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so you're flexible. In other words, oh, I'm very flexible. Yeah. What, what about people who are non-flexible? What would be the general rate that they should be looking at? You know, like, I, it seems like mixing is like sort of between 300 and 500 a day, depending, I mean, obviously it depends on who it is. Yeah. Um, and I would probably, I mean, I don't know. It's, it really depends on the studio that you're going to go to, you know, like the, the one thing that we've done at our places, we've kind of set it up like a rehearsal space because yeah. a lot of bands that I record don't play to clicks necessarily. So it's mm -hmm. just set up like live and you just come in and it's like your rehearsal space, basically. Um, but if you want something more, obviously it's going to be more. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. So it's hard uh, to say, actually. I mean, it's just really hard to say. Yeah. I'm just curious because, because I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I'm just trying to figure, because a lot of bands ask these types of questions. It's like, I don't fucking know. I got Ian here and who's the pro here. <laughs> like the average, the average is roughly around five grand for a record. Five grand. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. That's, that's, that's the answer I think I was looking for. Yeah. So, okay. So just, just, to, just to follow up on the, on the picking of the project. So you're not picky. You'll basically work with anybody as long as they're willing to put in the work. Yeah. 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 And you know, I, I mean, I have to, there has to be something there that I like. I mean, if I hate it, I'm not going to, 
I'm not going to work it. No. Well, I kind of would imagine that with your credits and stuff, I don't think you're really getting low quality people coming to you most of the time anyway. No, right? no. Yeah. And uh, I, I do actually really enjoy working with like first time bands too. I think that's, it's always pretty exciting watching a band be like, Ooh, that's, a, is that what we actually sound like? You know, and sometimes it's bad, but sometimes it's good. <laughs> you know, first time, totally. you know, sometimes bands exactly. come in and they're like, Oh my God, do we, we're that bad. You know, that's and then they that. realize the process of like going into the rehearsal space and practicing and all that stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. So. Um, okay. So actually one more quick question that's off script. <laughs> How did you kind of get into the production angle since you were the change of heart guy for like a long time and you've been in like a zillion other bands too, Right. How, which over, or were you always like that? And I just didn't know. Um, no, it, it sort of gradually came. I mean, I always had a Porta studio and was always dicking around and I was always watching um, the people that we worked with just yeah. to see how they did it. And um, we did uh, Joe Barisi, who did a lot of the Caius and yeah. Rage Against the Machine and stuff. He mixed one of the last Change Fart records. And it was just a real eye opener watching somebody from L.A. come in and mix a record and being like, holy shit. You know, like, this is somebody who's really amazing. Mm-hmm. And I I didn't photograph anything, but I was like really looking at the board going like, oh my God, this is how you're doing this. This is awesome. Thought completely? What's that? You're self-taught completely on this? Um, No, I mean, I watched a lot of people. So it's like I had a lot of good teachers, even though they weren't necessarily like a teacher teacher. So you, but I mean, you basically just watched and observed and watch and I, I'm, I'm the way I learn things is physically getting in there and getting dirty. So, uh, yeah. just, you know, turning knobs and like yeah. reading about stuff. Yeah. You didn't take you a know, school, take a class or anything is what I mean. I took a, like a very basic engineering class, but, uh, um, no, no. Okay. I'm not cool. like an engineer, like a uh, Steve Albini type engineer. Yeah. I'm more like a sound engineer. Like I, like, I like. I'm like, I love that sound. Let's go with that. You know, mm-hmm. right. Corinne, you want to ask the next one? Oh yeah, definitely. So, I mean, we've touched on how you collaborate with people on the production side, but on the music side, um, how do you choose people? Cause I know you've done a lot of collaborations with different groups and different people and everything. Um, how do you pick those projects as opposed to, you know, people coming to you for production? Hmm. Um, a lot of that is just happenstance and just like, uh, I've, the one thing I always find interesting is like, say you meet somebody, you know, a couple, couple weeks back and they mentioned it's somebody else. And then that person comes in and it just kind of evolves from there. And I, I feel the same way about musicians, you know, you meet musicians and you're like, you kind of, I, maybe and other people don't do this, but I kind of check mark people when I I'm like, that person is an amazing bass player. That person's amazing drummer or, or whatnot. So when the pro- new project comes around, I'm like, I want to play with they, these people, you know? And like, Mm -hmm. actually, I mean, with Future Now, it's like I played with the drummer Glenn um, in 92 and he was actually my neighbor. And it was like we hadn't played together in years. And I was like, you know, we should probably play together again. Mm -hmm. Um, One follow up on that, though, is like how how do you kind of find them other than just that? Because, I mean, do you get them like reaching out to you? Because, I mean, you're you're fairly well known in Toronto, I think. Mm -hmm. So. Do they, they, do they come to you and then then you kind of like kind of scope them out a little bit further? Or I think what? it's a bit, a bit of both. You know, it's also from playing shows. You know, if, when you mm-hmm. play with bands, you'll be like, oh, my God, the bass player is incredible in that band or, yeah. um, mm-hmm. or whatever. Um, but, yeah, some people do come toward me. But, you know, I, I think that, you know, with Instagram and people playing, you know, you being able to see people playing now much mm-hmm. more, um, it's maybe even a little easier. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like yeah. I see amazing bass players and drummers all the time. It's like, yeah. wow. Yeah. And so how would you like prefer somebody to like, say somebody wants to collaborate with you, what is the best way they could, you know, or approach you or how would you like to be approached for somebody being like, Hey, I want to work with Ian on X, Y, Z. Oh, I, I mean, people use Instagram, email, whatever, Twitter, so you know, none. So you don't have like a preferred method. Just any of them. No, I don't have a manager uh, for that stuff. So it's just mm-hmm. like whatever works works. Mm-hmm. That leads us into the next question. Man. <laughs> right. How was Which, that? Eh, that was pretty good. That was pretty yeah. good. That was actually the perfect segue. Um, management. We want to talk about. So obviously, I know you probably. I'm assuming you had a manager with Change of Heart. I oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and I assume you've had one with a couple other bands. I don't think you have one now. Correct. I don't. 
Okay. No. So we want to talk about it. So first thing is, do you think management is worth it? Yes. No. Why kind of explain it? Yes. Uh, except no, unless they're terrible. Fair. Um, like some of the best situations I've ever been involved in have come about because there was a manager and Fair. there was somebody, I mean, you know, I mean, it depends on what level you want your band to be at as well. I believe, you know, it's like, if you want to, wait, that sounds weird because I don't have a manager right now, but, um, um, you know, it's like, I think you do have to make a decision about what kind of thing you want to do. And it's like, if you're going to be totally DIY Fugazi black flag, then there's no manager. But if you want to take it somewhere higher, maybe then you need a manager, I think. Mm -hmm. So why did, why does Ian Blurton's future now not have a manager then out of curiosity? I, uh, uh, just haven't been able to find the right person i don't think okay that's fair enough and you're all but you're also able you've got enough connections at this stage of the game you probably don't necessarily need it quite as much correct it would be nice i i, th I think like one thing about management is like if you are looking at it as a worldwide thing then yeah. maybe, maybe unless you're the I'm, I'm not very organized in those kind <laughs> of areas so it's like i can do music you know 24 hours a day no problem but like the management part of things that's where i'm a little so it depends on how far you want to reach things it's like if you just want to be a band that plays toronto for example then having a manager is probably not that necessary mm -hmm. yeah well you're not planning on touring and well the pandemic's going on but you don't really <laughs> you know i think you did the one tour two years ago but you mainly yeah. you're, you're home to work right so yeah. Um, I mean, I, if the right opportunity came along, I would definitely tour, but it's. Oh. You know. Okay. Mm -hmm. I thought it was due to the production stuff and that your work that you may not want to buy out. No, I mean, I, no, I like touring a lot. Um, oh. And uh, it's just, you know, the, the grind of it can be really grinding, you know, it's yeah. like just doing the same thing over and over again is not necessarily super healthy. Yeah. yeah. Corinne, so you want to. Well, I had a follow up. So if you were looking for, you know, a manager or, you know, keeping your eyes open, what kind of things would you be looking for in somebody? Since you said you hadn't found the right person, what are the things that you're wanting that you're not finding? Um, I don't, I think there maybe used to be a, like the great managers that I've had have all had this kind of like crazy cavalier, like let, do anything to get something done, you know, like, not in a bad way, but like in a good way. But like, I mean, for example, we had a manager. So they're not who, leaving horse heads in people's beds. To no, get things not done. quite. But like we had a manager once who sent us to a show. We were playing in Vancouver. He sent us to a show in Calgary saying that we had gotten this gig. And he knew that we had not gotten this gig, but he sent us to the gig and we showed up and everyone was so confused that they let us play. <laughs> like, that's awesome. Yeah. And I was like, that is like now looking back on at the time maybe I was probably even like a little pissed but like now I'm like that is genius you know yeah that is yeah. pretty brilliant because I mean I've been at shows where things are super disorganized and I could easily see it being like wait did we say they could play exactly <laughs> exactly yeah. it's like he's running with it that. so just as a follow-up then so what would be the red flags that a band should be looking for with a manager with it in your opinion Oh, I mean, I think, you know, number one, if they're going to be taking care of the books and all that stuff, that has to be like, you know, a hundred percent on, on the money. It's like, um, cause that's where, you, you know, a lot of bands and managers run into problems. So if all, if all of that is transparent, then that's, that's, I think that's probably like the number one, especially if you're in a band that's obviously making money, it's like, you don't want to you don't want it to be like well where's where's the money you know yeah yeah and then they can't say anything about it okay yeah. what other what other uh red flags would you say other than accounting um well personality for me is is obviously huge um yeah. if somebody's it depends on how you want to be represented too you know it's like you know there's the peter grant type of manager that would you know like would there would be horse heads and things like that <laughs> and and then there's the mellow manager too, which is, yep. you know, and they're both very effective and it's just, you know, um, you have to decide how you want to be represented, you know? Sure. 
Some people think that, you know, you need the most cutthroat manager possible because the industry is so cutthroat and that you need somebody to balance that for you. Um, I don't know if I always agree with that, but. There, no, I get that. Yeah, definitely. And did you have any more follow-up questions, I, Curtis, before we. Did, but I didn't want to hog everything. So I was going to wait no, for you. No, go ahead. By okay. all means. That's totally fine. Okay, so. You just looked uh, like you wanted to say something. <laughs> I did, but I, I wasn't, I was trying not to be mean. Um, so next, next part about it. So. For, so so far we got personality we got um we got the books there's got to be a few more like is there anything like when the person actually approaches the band that they should be watching for an initial contact because you wouldn't really necessarily know those two things until you've been talking to them for a bit yeah no that's true um i you know i first impression to me is is a lot um fair uh mm -hmm. And there is, you know, I don't know if I, I would just, you know, for back of a lack of a better word, just like, how does that person make you like, do they make you feel comfortable? Do they make you feel uncomfortable? Yeah. Um, yeah. There's so many slimy people in the music industry that it's, you know, if your radar is up, then um, hopefully you're not going to be dealing with them. You know. Well, yeah, I guess, I guess, and I guess that the, if they're being asked to pay up front would probably be. Oh, sorry. Yes. No, I, I, yeah. Sorry. I didn't even think about that kind of stuff. I, yeah. If they're asking I, for I, retainers and things like that. It's like, yeah. oh my God. So what would be the standard amount that a band should expect to pay for management then out of the commission or gross, whatever it is? Oh, uh, um, again, I think those deals, some I've seen deals where the manager is just a member of the band. Oh, um, with a sunset clause, you know, so if they get fired or they quit, you know, like two years, the, the, the money goes down. Um, but that's after everything's been paid, then they start splitting the money. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I've seen lots of different deals basically. Um, and I think you just need to be, you know, I, you know, again, find something that you're comfortable with. Yeah. No, fair um, enough. Some managers own publishing, you know, it's like, um, some managers you know for example at cheap trick the manager owned the name mm -hmm. um and if you look at the back of i think it's dream police it's like his copyright is on it it's like you know so it's sometimes it goes really in depth yeah okay fair enough yeah. definitely and then yeah. so i mean you've probably worked with a million different industry professionals in your your career so red flags with management what are some different red flags that people should look for in somebody like um, potential producers that maybe they're not reaching out to you, but they're looking at other people to produce their record. What, what should they avoid at the very beginning? Oof. Oh my God, this could go on forever. Um, Bring it off. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 it all. I think uh, like, a, you know, like yellers and screamers and those types of people are, um, that's not really my thing. So mm -hmm. if I see anything like that, um, generally I'm like, uh, I would avoid that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, they don't, people like that don't make contacts that last for very long because they get into fights with people and, uh, just all that kind of stuff. You know, I think you have mm -hmm. to be very aware of that, especially right now, you know? Yeah. I think this, the whole pandemic situation has been a breeding ground for, scummy people to come out of the woodwork and try and take advantage. Cause I mean, we're so at the, like, while we may be more connected with technology, we're also still so separated from each other that, mm -hmm. yeah, it's been, it's been hard to watch all of that come out of the woodwork, like little worms. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then, so other than yelling and screaming, what are some other red <laughs> flags that people other than yelling and screaming is that like, say it's somebody who's, pretty level-headed but there's still red flags what would those red flags be i think not delivering maybe like um you know starting starting out with a new manager and if you say maybe have a few goals and those goals aren't delivered on and there's like maybe like oh well next time i'll do it it's like i i don't know that would be something that i'd be a little bit weird about mm -hmm. yeah definitely um, you know i think just somebody if they're not delivering basically i guess is probably a huge red flag mm -hmm. well that would also kind of go back to not answering you know messages and stuff for like mm -hmm. 
four or five weeks, I think. So, I mean, everybody misses messages, but there's, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I mean, like, for example, like, like if you were trying to contact me and I didn't see it on Gmail, I know you'd probably DM me by Twitter or text me or something. And I, I would, get, I would see one of them mm -hmm. and I get back to you. Right. But can you kind of go over how, how lack of communication would be a bit of a red flag? Um, well, I just think, cause it's gonna, it's gonna show how they're going to deal with people, you know, outside of your relationship as well. Right. So if, yeah. if they're doing that to you, then there's a possibility they're doing that outside of that. Um, and also, I mean, oh God, I just heard, I've heard so many horror stories of, you know, people making side deals and like yep. without telling the band and just things mm -hmm. like that. And it's like, um, I think just, you know, you have to find somebody who's honest, really, that's honest in your, in your world, you know. Where should people look? If they're looking for a producer, where should they look? Should oh, it be producer? like referrals or, or um I the way I always any, look anybody. is just I think look at the back of records that you like, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, um um like for example, that's how I mean Joe Brisi had done Sky Valley by Caius and I was like, "Oh my god, this record is incredible. I love this mix. I want to work with this guy." Mm -hmm. Now, um to follow up on one more thing I I wanted to ask about here. So well, this is a little bit of a little bit to do with red flags, a little bit not. Um, this is on the communication aspect. So, like, wh what did, what are kind of like? How do I want to phrase this? What are kind of the mistakes change a heart made when, like, with these type of things with communication aspects with producers or managers that you wish you would have realized then, if you get what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, a lot of it was us actually. Um, okay. It was mm -hmm. the band. Um, Fair enough. Um, we were terrible at communication. Um, <laughs> absolutely the worst. Fair. Um, and uh, I think a lot of managers tried with us and we were just just so wrapped up in being uh, that band that it was hard for us to bust out and see the bigger picture. So you guys, um, you, you guys had your own attitude. Thing oh going my God, on. yeah. We were just like the most insular four or five people who hated everyone um awesome <laughs> yeah uh, it was great it was great um not hated but you know we were like fuck all these bands um and uh, i think that's that's something that i've definitely learned is like you you really need to that's why i say it's like maybe communicate your ideas of what you want beforehand, yeah. before so that everyone knows that you're on the same page and all that kind of stuff so what would you say was the biggest mistake you guys made in terms of uh, industry type stuff? Oh my God. Um, <laughs> what did I open here? Oh my God. Um, well, I mean, for, you know, starter, I mean, just, there was a million things. It's like, um, for example, you know, we got a, we got a tour uh, opening for the Tragically Hip in all the, you know, the, the hockey arenas across Canada. And at no point did anyone say, or did we think you probably shouldn't play songs that are like 180 BPM, you know, like really fast songs in a hockey yeah. arena, because it's going to sound like, mm -hmm. and so we did for our whole tour. And it's like, and now I realize, especially after doing sound for bands in places like that, I'm like, that is the most idiotic thing. And <laughs> just sometimes you wish there was like a handbook that was like, and don't do this, you know? Well, out of curiosity, just that I didn't know you guys opened for the Tragically Hip. Um, mm -hmm. Just, you probably don't know who they are because they're, they're, they're like one of the biggest bands in Canada of all time, at least here. I'm they're sorry, not... I'm an American. Yeah, yeah no, just... okay. But they were huge in Canada. <laughs> yeah, Still are. They're... They played arenas. They were they were massive. Like they were they were huge in the nineties. So just okay. So did did that give you guys any opportunities though? That tragically hit too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it gave us the opportunity to play to you know, you know, thousands of people. I mean, God, we played to probably a hundred, hundred thousand people over. That is so weeks. That a is couple so of weeks. I mean, we opened for them once, and there was fifty thousand people at the show. It was like holy shit. Can I swear? Yeah, go for it. Holy <laughs> shit, that's a lot of fucking people. If you're standing on stage and looking out on that, that's like, wow. Wow. Where was that? Do you remember? That was at Muslim Park. It was the Canada Day. Nice. Yeah. That's fucking crazy. I can't believe how much they drew in their prime. That's just... 
mind blowing. Oh, okay, I'm getting I'm getting off topic though because now I want to want to know about you playing in front of the with the tragically hip. But back to what we were talking about, uh, red flags. So red flags with PR. Well, let, let's we'll go with PR since you can use me as a as a shooting boy if you want. <laughs> No, I won't actually, because you actually did what you said you were going to do, which is comes back to the communication thing. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I've had some very bad experiences with PR in Europe specifically. Uh, we're hiring people going over there on a tour and like absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, that's I don't even know how we could have seen that that was going to happen, but it did happen. So what would be the red, but what would be the actual red flag that you need to look for? Like when you talk to me, like, I mean, all I did was I tweeted, I think I said, I like public animal at one mm -hmm. point. And then you, then you like reached out to me just cause I said, I like public animal, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so what would you be looking for? Because like, I mean, like with me, it was kind of, to me, it seemed kind of random. Like our relationship was just like, basically I tweeted and you saw my tweet. So yeah. isn't that I, how you meet everyone? Apparently. Yeah, but I mean, that is, that's, that's a great way. That's a, you know, that's something that's nice about social media is like, oh, here's somebody who's mildly interested in what I'm doing. It's like, yeah. let's see how far we can go with this, you know? So I, I let's back it up a little bit. So, okay. So let's, let's kind of go like with, with hiring PR before we go to red flag. So you reached out to me based on solely on a tweet. So how did you kind of decide you wanted to work, work, work with me, for example, based upon a tweet? I, um, well, I just did some, you know, I, I did a background check and, oh, uh, back. and, oh, Jesus Christ. Sorry. <laughs> and, uh, I did a background check and just, uh, you know, it seemed like it was a good fit. Cool. Um, cool. and I don't want to diss other PR people. Um, but it just, it seemed like a really good fit. Cool. Mm -hmm. No, that's fair enough. So what should a band be looking for when they're hiring, when they're hiring something, someone like that for publicists? I think, yeah. you know, I think maybe the reason you had some success and, you know, other people didn't is because it was more of a, you, you know, you're specifically going after like a hard rock. I yeah. mean, we're not a metal band, obviously, but mm -hmm. um, you fall, yeah, you metal, fall in the metal elements or whatever, but it's like, you know, yeah. you're more on that side of it. And so it's like the right, right place for it to go you know yeah fair i enough. think i think if you're like you know if you're playing in a rock band you're hiring a pop publicist then that is that's not going to work you know it's like they're not going to have the right list and you know yeah. all that kind of stuff yeah and i think also as well did you guys not generally usually just focus on uh pr for canada versus worldwide before or am i mistaken? exactly exactly yeah and i think that's a huge difference yeah yeah, because I don't like. I mean, I remember when I was shopping around at first. They're like, I don't know who this is, but this is really fucking good. And I was kind of surprised because, like, everybody in Ontario who's listened to rock music seems to go, "Oh, I know who that is, right?" So um, that's kind of leading into the next question: is kind of like, how do you kind of figure out who the best person is based upon where you should be reaching? Because I mean, obviously, your past publicists thought you should be focused on Canada. I figured worldwide. they weren't actually they were necessarily they were Canadian publicists they're well, like I not, too, but I yeah. mean but yeah. I mean I no but I mean like they specifically do Canada oh I see yeah. okay you are actually one of the few people I find that actually does the whole thing oh really okay yeah I mean I mean I didn't know that that's yeah. amazing I mean cool. there are obviously there are other people do but yeah yeah okay cool um Corinne you want to follow up on any of this before I go back into red flags with PR? No, go keep going back into red flags. I think that's super important for people, especially the newbies and, yep. you know, even people like me for who are still learning on like what not to do. <laughs> so definitely cool. I think that goes helpful. across the board though. It's like, if you want to, you know, having a, a manager who manages rap acts doing a metal band, probably not going to work, mm -hmm. you know? That would be amazing. And so like with the manager, the booking agent, the label, um, mm -hmm. You know, sometimes labels have, you know, the one weird act and that works great. But, you know, for the most part, I think you you don't necessarily have to stick to a scene, but like at least have something in there that's going to respond to what you're looking for, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also, like, I think the background check, like you mentioned, is always important because there can be like, I don't know if you've noticed this, but there's a lot of people that will play upon a connection they once had. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, for example, I was in a big band back in the 80s, right? Oh. Or was some back in the 80s, right? Yeah. All so, the time. Um, All the time. 
So how do you, how, okay, so how do I want to phrase this? How do you think people can kind of differentiate between legit and not legit? Because like I said, there's sometimes people are telling the truth, mm -hmm. but it was like 80s or 90s or it hasn't happened for like 10 years. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So how do you tell? You just need a good bullshit detector, you know, like a, that's really. Fine -tune it. Mm -hmm. huh? You got to fine tune it. Yeah, you got to mm -hmm. fine tune it. And, you know, just like you can usually tell, you know, I don't know. I, I find that like, it depends if they're still working too. It's like, I, if somebody's saying, Oh, I did this great thing in the eighties, but they're not doing anything anymore. It's like, I find that a little bit more hard to believe, you know? Yeah. No. I like, what have like, you been doing for 30 years? Yeah, exactly. It's like, well, yeah. how come you haven't gotten better on guitar or, you know, whatever, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. exactly. Um, one more thing I want to uh, ask you before we wrap up, did you win a Juno or just play the Junos out of curiosity? I played Juno Fest, which I is like played... the festival they have. Okay. I thought you did something with the guy from Sloan at some at one point or something like that. Did you? Mm -mm. No. No? Okay. I was sure you did. Okay. Did you do a collaboration with him? Which guy? I can't remember. Whatever the guy's name is from Sloan. The... Chris? It, it doesn't look alike to me. Um, <laughs> no. I hope you're not... Wow. <laughs> okay. No. But, well, I had a question about the Juno just because I, I work with Lindsay Schoolcraft who was nominated for Juno recently and I have a question about that if you know like okay so I was a I was on the 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 metal panel for the Junos I don't know the answer to this question that good when were you on the metal when were you on the metal panel? uh for two years about five years ago okay so it's, so it's fairly recently so kind of like how do how do they kind of pick who are going to be on the ballot do you know um, I was on the round before they chose the ballot. So I guess they have oh. like levels of judges. Okay. And uh, one, uh, there was some political maneuvering on the, the last year I did it that, um, I, let me just make sure I got this right, but I'm pretty sure they took Voivod out and they put the flatliners in. And that really, really bummed me out. That's weird. Why would they yeah. take out Voivod? Because they, I think... Man, I'm not remembering it 100, percent but oh, good. I think it was because they they needed a place to put the flatliners, mm -hmm. something it was like that. Really political. I, you know, I don't know the whole thing, but yeah, I, I feel like it Double was. Learning. All I, I know is Voivod was out, and I was like, oh, come on. Okay, now 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 last question I got is um, if you ever did get nominated for a Juno for something, if you ever did, um, would you go? And would, would you consider that to be an achievement for you? Do you like, does it not matter to win the awards? Well, I mean, you know, you do have to pay to get a nomination and you have to apply. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people don't realize that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, I don't know. I don't, it's not, it would be great for my parents, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Something they can put on their fridge. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> This is the sound quote of the day. This would be great for my parents if I won a Juno or got Yeah, nominated. yeah. It's like I don't, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> okay, well, it's not a priority to you. It's not a priority to me. No. That's amazing. Uh, what else do we want to cover? There's like so much we could cover with you, but I mean, it's like you got so many different fucking hats that you wear, and you got so many things that you do, and so many accomplishments. I'm just trying to think. Um, last question I have for you is: What do you think has been your biggest your your most proudest accomplishment to date out of all the shit that you've done. Oh, wow. Sorry. Um, wow. It's going to sound kind of cheesy, but I think it's the new record I'm working on right now. It is kind of cheesy. How about, how about yeah. prior to new record? What's that? How about prior to new record? Cause it is kind of cheesy, but yeah. Um, I don't know. I just, uh, I don't know. That's a tough question. Oh. Uh, that's what happens when you do a lot yeah yeah start end up being know. like proud of all of it and i mean yeah I, yeah i mean it's like i guess the the body of work maybe okay that cool. would be that would be you know and and uh i guess you know one thing about making records for people is like helping them make their you know dreams come true and uh sometimes bands are so overwhelmed by the final product and stuff that it's really amazing in a good way yeah. um uh it's awesome to see that and just see somebody be like oh my god that's a record i wanted to make you know 
Yeah, it's it's the purpose thing, trying to help people reach their own exactly. purpose. Exactly, yeah. you know, and uh, and you learn a lot from that, you know. I, yeah. I, I find that, like, even the bad things that happen, you learn from them and, you know, try yeah. to move forward from that. Yeah, and uh, actually, one more final question from me, and then I'll ask Corinne if she's got any more. <laughs> You, can you just stole, up. you stole my final question. He well, does this no. to me like every single show. Well, I, I'm going to ask, are you a musician or a producer first? Oh, I think I'm a musician. Are you? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I think cool. one is, one is like in your soul and the other one is your, your technical skills that you enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. And if that, that might be wrong, but yeah, that, that makes sense being a musician first. <laughs> yeah. I think there's a sense of freedom in being a musician that I really love. I mean, when you're playing, when you're playing an instrument, it's, I don't know, it's pretty awesome. Awesome. So, so we're going to wrap. Oh, Corinne. Oh, I actually have one question. Wow. Right. What is something that you haven't done yet that you still want to do? Because you've done so much but is there still something in there that you're like, I really want to do that before I'm done? I really want to tour Europe one more time with mm -hmm. uh, this band. I've never toured the future now has never gone to Europe and I really want to go to Europe or even Japan, whatever, anywhere outside Canada. Anywhere big outside in Japan. Japan. Big in Japan. Yes. Become big in Japan. <laughs> That'd be fine by me. Fuck. Work for scorpions. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so we're going to wrap up here. Um, so anything you want to plug before we do, Ian? Uh, nope. Okay. Uh, what, <laughs> what about, I, I'm going to plug, I'm going to plug, check out Future Now um, on Bandcamp. I can't remember what the band, it's not under Future Now. What is it? It's under? just Ian Blurton Bandcamp. Okay. Ian Blurton Bandcamp. I, I, B-L-U-R-T-O-N, I think is how you spell it, right? Yeah, that's it. Cool. Okay. Check out his music. Also check out uh, his other bands. I don't think Change of Heart is anywhere really nowadays. Other than no, we just play a show every now and then when a reissue yeah. comes out or whatever. Yeah, but can you stream? You can't stream it anywhere though, can you? Uh, yep. There's two records up. Okay, never mind. Check, check out Change of Heart too, and then check out uh, Public Animal. And I, you got a whole bunch of other bands that's slipping my mind, but I know. Come on. Um, so <laughs> check them out, and I think that's all we got. Party on, Corey. Party on, Curtis. Party on, Ian. Thank you. Yeah.